Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 144. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like you to learn all about knives and knife collecting, hear from the knife designers, the knife makers, the manufacturers, the knife reviewers, anybody who loves knives. That's what we are all about here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. And uh, Bob, before we uh, get into our intro of our guest and the the interview, surprise YouTube viewers, a little different look. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Hey, yeah, we, I'm yeah, we <laughs> sorry, I'm not talking about you, Jim. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can see us now, and and this is actually what we see every time we record a podcast or uh, uh, or, or do an interview. Right. It's a lot like Thursday Night Knives, and right. I think it's a form everyone's familiar with. Right. But Except in this case, <laughs> they get to see you. So welcome, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> I'm familiar with the uh, behind the scenes, as they say. I have a face for radio, so uh, that's the reason I've been uh, reluctant to be on camera, but uh, going to give this a whirl and uh, see how it goes. So uh, please be kind to me in the comments, if you don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> All right, uh, enough about us. Uh, we've got a great guest that you're going to be talking to today. Who is uh, who is it, Bob, for episode number well, 144? My guest is David Cam. Now, just a few short years ago, uh, David was a fledgling knife lover and he started his uh, youtube channel uh, knife review channel blade banter and uh, now he's a man with his own knife company and his uh, first fully funded fully crowdfunded uh, project ready to go into production the solaris button lock knife that's gotten a lot of uh, a lot of really uh, good reviews and and a lot of excitement building up around it on youtube yeah. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about the uh, the Kickstarter, the crowdfunding, all that kind of good stuff. It's uh, it's great to see uh, success in that field and uh, be interesting to uh, hear that interview coming up next. You know you're a knife junkie if you're as happy as a kid on Christmas morning when that new knife arrives in the mail. Uh, my guest is David Cam, as I just mentioned. David, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. It's great to have you here, sir. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on. Great uh, intro, by the way. Ah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, It's my pleasure to have you here. And actually, it's also my pleasure to have in hand your Solaris knife. Solaris uh, by Orion Knives. That's your knife company. And this came to me uh, through the Apex Pass Around group, uh, which you head up, which we'll talk about in a little while. Uh, But it's been a real pleasure having this knife over the last 24 hours. It is uh, a hell of of an accomplishment. But uh, you know, I want to find out, you know, I've got this knife in hand, but you haven't been in this uh, hobby for too long. How did you get started? Yeah, it was just really just watching reviews, trying to get a hobby. Uh, so sometimes uh, your wife says, uh, go get a hobby. And uh, that was one of the hobbies to pick up. Uh, so I uh, got into knives uh, just a little bit here and there. I was actually talking with uh, the Knife Beater channel, Jay. Uh, so kind of top, uh, coming in his uh, videos, kind of more lengthy comments. And then he was like, hey, why don't you just try and do a video or maybe be on his show? And then so I just went up, did a video. So that's where I started with everything. I uh, started out with uh, one of the button locks, uh, which was a CRKT TITAC 2. Uh, so that was actually my first video that I put up. Uh, so that's kind of uh, it kind of originated in a button lock, uh, plunge lock, and then kind of uh, progressed from there uh, within uh, the knife hobby. So how did that hobby, how did your love of knives uh, blossom and grow? I mean, uh, on your on your page, you talk about EDC gear, which makes it sound mm-hmm. general, but we're all actually really just in it for the knives. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of it. And I mean, that's where, uh, that's really where it is. I mean, I do have like a little pocket slip where I have like a little, uh, like a Kershaw pub. It's on my little pry bar. Uh, it has uh, basically the little um, sheath, or the the slip is actually from uh, Pop of Leather, which is uh, handmade in Canada. Uh, so they actually um, have a really good product. So kind of check those things out, and then that's where I just really got into it. And then the biggest thing of, for me in starting the channel was I didn't get to talk to anybody about knives. So most of the, my coworkers, um, I had a Kershaw fraction. Um, so if anybody knows that, mm-hmm. that is a tiny knife. It's probably like yay big. 
um, that scared people. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting, interesting thing to try and uh, even get into it, have somebody have a conversation about the knives. Uh, so that was where the channel started. And then I was able to you know, kind of connect with um, Stasa23, um, mm. who was heading up uh, the Apex at that time, and also Zalric. Uh, they were basically co-running uh, the Apex Passaround group. And then so got hooked up with them uh, through Best Tech. And then I kind of started from there and then uh, eventually took over for the administration role. Well, so the TIE TAC 2 was your first video for the Blade Banter mm -hmm. channel. But what was what was the first knife? Maybe it was that that really got you hooked, that 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 got you uh, to understand that not only are you going to probably spend a lot of money in this hobby, but that you might down the road actually get involved with manufacturing. Yeah, it really progressed uh, kind of oddly. I mean, it kind of uh, kind of had a big uptake. Uh, so the first knife that I actually picked up was a Kershaw. Um, it was actually, which one was that? The Skyline. So it's a classic, classic knife. I did so many different reviews. I mean, uh, I looked into it and I did a lot of research. Um, all the other YouTube channels out there, I looked at and I've written articles on it. It's like, okay, that's going to be the only knife I will ever buy. It's going to be a Kershaw Skyline. That'll be my one knife that I'll ever buy. 40 bucks is like, that's a lot to spend on a knife, but um, i done a lot of <laughs> research on it. Yeah, yeah, I'll have it forever, 40 bucks. So that's gonna be a good investment for that. Uh, so that was actually my first knife. And I was a bit let down by many people on the detent wasn't really there. Uh, so I was able to pick up on some of those things right off the bat. And that's kind of uh, where I kind of went, okay, well, it, what's that? And then after researching it, then, okay, we'll move on to the other one. What are the locks are there? What are their knives are there? Uh, what are the companies? Uh, so it just, I'm always about research. Um, that was kind of, um, I once tried to get into wristwatches um, as far as like getting the old ones and trying to bring them back. Uh, they're just way too small for pieces. Uh, I went and actually fixed one of the, uh, the Timex watches. I bought like an eBay uh, whole thing. And then I was like, oh, I got one working and I touched something wrong and I bent something and it just stopped working. I was like, I'm done with that. I'm not going to do that anymore yeah so it was kind of one of those things is i always like mechanisms well, always interested in it let me let me ask you uh, in as much as you want to divulge what do you do in your uh, in your non-knife life that you are uh that you're rebuilding watches fixing watches and and yeah. making not designing knives yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it was kind of, uh, we had a family business of uh, automotive repair uh, before. So that was kind of the initial thing. That's the thing I thought I was going to be doing for the rest of my life uh, is automotive repair. Uh, so we had the family business. I'm actually from Hawaii. Uh, so that's kind of where I started from um, as far as where I lived. Uh, and then I uh, yeah, moved out to Oregon. Uh, so that's where I'm now. And then cost of living is a lot better everything like that. But uh, I kind of went away from that because it was kind of a, a room and board type of thing. So I appreciate my father for wanting to build something for the family, uh, trying to make a, a business for all of us. It just didn't work out too well for that. And so we weren't able to keep on to it and uh, keep on going. Uh, but uh, went and did you know, regular retail work, um, soul sucking job. Uh, it was I was in that for a long time. I mean, it was like, I think 18 years. Uh, so after I got out of that uh, retail world, I was able to kind of find myself again. And that's kind of where the hobby um, kind of started at the end of that. And then it kind of uh, progressed once I uh, left from uh, that world and I was able to find myself a little bit better. So was that you just had some some time left fallow? You could just kind of dig into yeah. and your wife yeah. told you to get a hobby and you yeah. found the knife hobby. Boy, was yeah, she sorry. I did. Huh? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of one of the things she got me an extra shirt from Amazon is like, like caution may start talking about knives or something it's like a <laughs> random shirt. So it actually works really well. So uh, how long do you think it took you? Well, I guess you could probably chart it. Uh, literally with your channel, but uh, in your mind, you know, take us through uh, how you go from sort of gathering your preferences from collecting knives and sort of discovering what you what you like and what you don't like uh, to to coming up with the design for the Solaris and 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 uh, you know how how did that how did it come yeah. to this? Yeah. And so it started, and so the channel started back in, it was 2018, if I'm not mistaken, from it. And then I went over to like the Blade Show. Uh, so Blade Show West, it was, a, I think the first year they came to Oregon. Uh, so that was the Portland show. And then at uh, that time I was already, I was probably about 400 subscribers. I'm not really huge now. So a lot of people that have started uh, after me have well surpassed me, but it's still about the you know, communication, that conversation, but uh, did uh, talking with different uh, makers. Uh, one of the ones that really stuck out was like Leong Ma. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually stated like, what makes you different? 
Um, and that's kind of like kind of stuck with me for a while as far as like what does make me different like than other YouTube channels, other folks out there. Uh, so that's something that kind of stuck with me for that. And then just able to handle different knives. So that's one thing good about being a part of uh, the Apex Pass Round Group and just reviewing knives. I'm able to handle things uh, without going as broke, uh, so I would say. Uh, so that's kind of the good thing about it. You can't really see every single knife um, that's new and exciting. Uh, but through the Apex, through working with the manufacturers, uh, we're actually able to see those things, handle it. And then so... When I'm handling them, I'm like, oh, I like how this feels. I like how this shape is. Uh, so that's kind of where it went along. But it was never really a thing of, I like this part about it. I like the blade. I like everything about it. So that's kind of where it progressed from uh, where um, where my preferences start to build. And then mm -hmm. that's where um, it really just started uh, from uh, one of those blade shows where uh, one of the companies was putting on a, like, a, we'll render your knife if you win the competition as far as how many likes you get. Cool. So that was kind of where I, I, I went in. I drew something on BC even. So this is my little box. So I drew on, oops, wrong way. Oh, wrong way. There you go. So I drew on the box. I made it actually working uh, with everything oh. here. <laughs> uh, so, so this is kind of where it started from uh, for the knife. I didn't win that, of course, uh, but that was where I was like, well, I'll, I'll just keep on going with it. Uh, so that was probably back in June. Uh, and then it seems like the process has gone a lot longer than I expected, but in hearing some of the you know, the podcasts or some of the things that were even TJ Schwartz was talking about, most knives has about a two-year dwell period from uh, basically the design all the way to in the hand of the person. Uh, so actually, if, if you're looking at that type of thing, I'm actually a little bit ahead of that. So I'll be probably be about a year and a half uh, to market and to actually people in hand. Uh, so. Uh, that's kind of an interesting thing and really a nice thing. And really CRKT with the TITAC 2 was kind of that start. And then they didn't really um, hit the niche for what I liked about a button lock. And then so I was excited about it. Um, this is before the deadlock came out or the deadbolt uh, mm -hmm. lock came out. And then I was like, okay, I was excited and they're going to be coming out with another button lock. And then when that hit the market, I was kind of let down by it. So if they had come out with a fantastic button lock, I probably wouldn't make a knife. Um, but it was just like I was let down by it, okay. so it was kind of like something that kind of kept it going. So I want to find out about your design goals for for the Solaris, mm -hmm. um, and and also um, why it all centers around the button lock. It seems like yeah. it centers around the button yeah. lock. Yeah, a lot of it is. I mean, that's kind of the heart and soul about a lot of the knives. And um, so you might have like the ones that can hang a car off of it. Uh, you're going to have other ones that are just non-locking. But the button lock, I feel, is kind of an underused lock. I mean, you can probably have, um, if you throw out, okay, what's your best button lock? Uh, there's not a lot out there. There's probably maybe maybe 20. If you went and took in like custom makers and everything else, there's not a lot of them. Uh, so I'm probably understating that a little bit. But if you go over, uh, there's just not a lot. So it has a fidget factor. Uh, so that's one thing I really liked about the button lock. Uh, it has a, a strong lock. So it's basically kind of a shear type of mechanism. Uh, so you actually have to break that off. Um, maybe you can have a little bit of slippage to have that button pop, pop back out. Uh, but it really... Um, exemplifies the fidget factor because I am not a hard use person. I don't uh, have knives that I go and take out and baton all the time, uh, but I do fidget with my knives more than I cut with them. Uh, so that's where the button lock really uh, kind of scratched that itch for that and actually took care of that. And then uh, that's where I kind of went down that road and uh, stuck, stuck to uh, going with the button lock on it. I, uh, well, I've had it for 24 hours and I've been, um, fidgeting with it quite a lot. And one of the things that you boast <clears throat> on uh, in the literature for this knife is that you can open it more than five ways, which to me is an yeah. interesting way of putting it. I have, I have what I think are my five ways. Yeah. It's the slow roll, the thumb flip, the spidey flick, yeah. the lock depression, and mm -hmm. then the flipper. But what yeah. you say more than five, but you yeah, don't say no, six. I, so yeah, yeah, it's like you have an inertia flip for it. So that's one thing I don't like about like, people saying that gravity. Uh, so gravity is a little bit different. So if you let go, you press the button lock, it will be a gravity here, so it will fall open. Uh, but yeah. inertia is kind of where you actually have to shake it open. So it does shake oh, open uh, with some you. force and everything like that. Uh, but uh, I, I, there's, it's not really like a Rubik's cube of a type of knife where you have like endless not a number of things to open with it. But I think you got all of them. Okay. Okay. Well, the thing that really strikes me about this, uh, about this whole setup is the, are the angles here, uh, from the, 
from the pivot to the flipper to the thumb stud, they all are definitely optimized to rocket that blade out. And mm -hmm. it's also on a multi-row bearing pivot, yeah, yeah. Yeah. which uh, you know obviously adds to the to the super smoothness. But to me, I, I think the real success of this is in this setup here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it has a really good as far as uh, the leverage for it. Uh, so one thing, even with the Medford knife, so I, I bought a Medford Smooth Criminal because that was like the button lock from them. Uh, mm -hmm. I felt that the, the detent was really bad on it. And sometimes button locks have that issue where the detent isn't very strong, uh, but where they have placed their flipper tab is below the pivot. Uh, so that's why I really wanted to get it above in handling some other knives. Uh, having it above uh, gives a little bit more acceleration that you can get on it. Uh, so that's why I put it above the pivot. Uh, you can't uh, push button it. Uh, I mean, guess, um, um, I guess somebody, somebody call, people call it push button. So you actually go and actually push the pivot or the flipper tab in. You right. can't do that with any knife that's the flipper tabs above the actual um, the, um, the pivot. Uh, so this one basically has the light switch side of it, but does not have that push button uh, side of things. But that's where I put it above. And so that's why I was just really trying to figure out uh, what was I finding to be kind of lacking in some of the other knives. And I was trying to incorporate that the best I could uh, within the Orion Solaris. And Orion really came for my kids because they would go outside and then they would be like, oh, Orion's belt and everything else. And that's they're really important to me. Um, hopefully, like other people have kids, I think you have a daughter, and I don't know if you have any other uh, kids. Yeah, I have two daughters, yeah. Oh, two daughters. Okay, so I have three boys. Uh, they're all six years old uh, because they're all triplets. Uh, wow. So it takes a, it, it's a lot. Uh, terrible twos doesn't exist. Terrible five sticks when they actually have a little bit more into uh, having a feel of their own destiny uh, is kind of uh, makes it hard. <laughs> Uh, well, looking at looking at the design of this and this setup, how much would you say that your, you know, you're talking about your family's automotive uh, experience and and your experience with that? How much would you say that your understanding of mechanics um, inform that design? I'm not too sure how much it actually played into it. It was always kind of a factor of like you know, fidgeting with things, being able to like have a tactile feel. Uh, so that's kind of where I think I was able to understand some of those things. I wouldn't say that that was the whole main thing for it, but it's just something that kind of always stuck with me as far as being able to kind of handle things, trying to figure things out. Uh, so um, even with doing things like I haven't done before, I'll read like instructions and just kind of go, like, like rebuilding a deck or something like that. So it's kind of doing that jack of all trades type of thing um, to try and figure things out and trying to figure out how things operate. So what were your goals in designing this knife? Uh, the goal was to um, just really get a really solid uh, button lock, um, get something that's really comfortable in hand, um, something that actually is for um, the general population. So for me, for $40 uh, was a lot to spend for a first knife. Um, it's a lot to spend for a lot of people. A lot of people have their $10 knives and they run through $10 knives over and over again. Uh, but I wanted to have it somewhat attainable uh, for those folks, but it's still kind of an enthusiast knife because the $80 mark is something when people are starting to get uh, more enjoyment out of their knives, having more of a collection. So that's where I went with that price point because then once I was able to work with QSP, which is the manufacturer uh, for the knife, I was able to get the cost and figure, okay, where is this going to end up as far as my uh, actual retail value for the customer? And then I was aiming for 75, uh, I went up to 80. Uh, so I'm still within that mark. I didn't jump it a, a lot uh, from that, uh, but it was just a lot of just trying to figure out those things. And really, I think I got uh, most of what I wanted out of it. I, I, I have a whole bunch of people that looked at it. I haven't had anybody say, throw it in the trash, it's, a, it's garbage. Uh, so they've actually been able to enjoy it, uh, really getting a lot of positive feedback from it, which I like because, I mean, that's the thing. I just wanted to make it something that other people could enjoy as well. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an enthusiast's knife uh, made by an enthusiast, but that doesn't mean only an enthusiast could uh, could yeah, appreciate indeed. and carry this and, and have it for a long time. Um, <clears throat> The uh, uh, one of the things that really impressed me is how you handled the you know because I know your your goal was to get it under a hundred bucks. You mm. supply a, a titanium mill titanium clip that you yep. can reverse to the other side, which is a rarity. Yeah, and it is. but it's also it's also very discreetly pocketed on the mm -hmm. on the off side where it's not used. You barely notice that there's a pocket yeah. uh, milled out of the G10. 
Yeah, and so some reviewers missed that too when they were looking at it. They're like, "Oh, it's not left hand carriers." Oh, no, it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like that because you're giving you're giving uh, everyone an opportunity uh, to carry this knife, but but you don't have some big ghastly holes or a filler yeah. tab. You know, filler tabs are. I don't know. Yeah, you know. I don't know. Yeah, it's it it's there. I mean, you might as well just yeah. leave it there. You don't need to have a tab for it. Uh, but that's yeah. where it is. It's it's still ambidextrous as far as a lock. So you're just using your pointer finger or your thumb. Uh, so it's not as ambidextrous as normal, like the um, access lock or something like that. Uh, but it's much better than probably like a Spyderco uh, compression lock, uh, as far as a left hand operation. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So, so you come up with the design, you, you figure out what your design goals are. You start designing this knife. Mm -hmm. um, how many iterations did it go through before you uh, shopped it around and how did that process work? Uh, that process is very difficult. Uh, so uh, really, uh, as far as the design side, I had paper, so you saw the box, and then I went over um, and learned draft site. Uh, so uh, that was just through YouTube and trying to figure it out. I love draft site. It was a really good process for me to be, yeah, draft site. Uh, so now some people use that, and um, I don't think people use it as much anymore, uh, but it is something that was super intuitive for me. I was able to basically take the blade, take the handle, really move it around, make sure it didn't hit anything uh, when I was using it. Uh, and I really did that uh, within the 30 day trial period of draft site. Uh, so I never bought draft oh, site. Okay. <laughs> so so <laughs> that's where I started with it, the 2D rendering. Uh, I still like it. And so maybe I'll pick it up. But uh, there's other uh, software that seems like is more of an industry standard that I'll probably have to learn because um, like you know, Fusion 360 is a, a very powerful yet frustrating uh, program because of that. Uh, yeah. So that's one thing I've been playing around with. But shopping around, uh, as far as doing that, uh, that's one thing that I really found to be difficult because when I initially built it, I was wanting to have it a, a USA manufactured knife. Uh, and a lot of people are going that way now, uh, but this is still what I wanted to do back in uh, 2019. Uh, but it's almost impossible to do. Uh, so that's where uh, something that anybody that's actually an OEM manufacturer, USA, that um, that wants to really capitalize on it, I think it's going to be something that's some uh, a market that can be totally dominated on. Maybe not in the sub market where this one is for eighty dollars, but probably that hundred fifty to two hundred dollar mark uh, can really be taken advantage of. Because I shopped it around to people that have. Um, their own uh, sites and everything else. I'm not going to call them out here, but I went and I talked to them and they just said they're too busy with their own products. Uh, they don't have time to bring on anything new. Uh, probably if I was really uh, large or if I had a, a large money account, I could probably get in there and do collaborations and whatnot. But they just weren't available for that. So, um, were it, these domestic? I'm sorry, these yeah, domestic. domestic sorry, yeah, okay. yeah. That's mm -hmm. where I started with. And I'm trying to figure it out as far as I started <laughs> domestic, and I really wanted to try and get it to be a USA manufactured product, uh, but it just was not available. I found uh, one guy Keith on Instagram that I guess does some work, uh, so I uh, that might be an interesting one to go about um, to try and figure out maybe for a future model or something, but there's not a lot of folks that do OEM work, at least on the lower grade scale. And that's something that if anybody's dealt with uh, like a Chinese manufacturer, and that's what QSP is, uh, they can take your product uh, from that that piece of paper or that napkin, uh, render it, get it through all the processes, get it to um, a design portion, uh, engineering, production. Uh, they'll give you the pricing for it. Uh, so it's really that type of all um, encompassing a product that is really missing from the United States. So you could probably find somebody that would make your handle scales, they'll, they'll cut your blanks, uh, they'll go and do the heat treat, uh, but there's not anybody you can go to and, okay, this is my drawing. Um, how much would this cost to make? Uh, what's the 3D print look like? So I had two 3D prints made. Uh, so basically this is the first one uh, that was made for it. The first 3D print, and then uh, the second 3D print made. Uh, so it didn't change very much. There was just a matter of a little bit of rounding uh, for some sections, like uh, this section got rounded a little bit. Uh, tab's about the same uh, for it, but oop, that's really hard to see. Uh, but mm -hmm. everything kind of uh, fell through with the kind of this um, type of setup. So there wasn't a lot of changes from the two designs, but this was all done uh, through OEM manufacturing through QSP. So it's something that's available uh, in that aspect that really is just missing uh, from the United States. And that's kind of a hard thing about it. And so as much as people are harping on like, well, don't buy Chinese knives, don't buy this company's knives. Well, give me an option. 
Right, right. And they have such capacity, it seems. Uh, if you can be a full production house, soup to nuts, you, you take a design from a napkin mm -hmm. and you have enough designers who can interpret that uh, in a, in a uh, timely way. I mean, that just means their capacity is massive. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, so you get this. You you find QSP, yeah. and how does that work? Do they license your uh, your model and put it out as a QSP knife? No, or? no. Yeah, this one. Uh, so I started working with QSP. Um, basically, it kind of came out of blue. So through the Apex Pass Around Group, I reach out to different companies and see if they want to kind of join in. And this is how that the group works. You only need to send one knife around, and we'll send it to these people that are interested. So QSP was one of the companies that I reached out to. And kind of out of the blue, they were like, do you want to go to um, to Blade Show? And I was like, maybe. I don't know you very well. Uh, but um, it was kind of a, a little scary for the part. It's like some random company asking me if I want to go to a show. Uh, but I, I went to the show. Um, I wasn't affiliated with them at that time. Uh, but then they brought me out there, took care of things. I worked the booth. And then I uh, eventually became basically the QSP USA representative. So that's where uh, folks that have issues with their knives, um, it comes to me, email uh, and everything else, uh, some of the service that comes to me. So I already built that relationship with them prior. So that's where um, I still checked around with some of the other folks, uh, but I ended up going with them because I already worked with them, I already knew them. And then we were able to kind of um, hash things out for the rest of the way. So it is my design. It's not a, a license through QSP, it's just manufactured through them. So they're the OEM uh, for my design and my company. Right, right. That was a totally absent-minded question because I'm, I'm actually looking across the room at the box that this comes in and your yep. marketing is uh, real on point. I mean, uh, the packaging for this knife, uh, which hasn't even been uh, released yet, is really nice packaging. It comes with a with a cool little pen, and the whole thing is a is a is a nice little package. It's not some throwaway box. How how do you plan on marketing this once it's out? I feel like you've had a lot of really great exposure mm -hmm. thus far. Once it's a um, my thing how does that work okay so you you get them to agree so you you go through kickstarter mm -hmm. i'm sorry you got to take me through this process yeah, there's yeah, so yeah. much i don't understand there, there's there's so many different steps to it now so that's where it could be longer than necessary but uh so that's where um so once i was able to figure out with qsp as far as what the cost was uh, for me um, i went with kickstarter because it's a reputable source uh, for crowdfunding uh, there's people that say well why don't you pre uh, do pre-orders I don't want to take your money and then not be able to make it and then have to refund all your money. I don't like that idea. Uh, some people, it works for a lot of people. I, I don't want to knock that. Uh, but for me, it's like, this is how much I need to make this knife. If I can't make it there, you're not getting charged. That, that's what Kickstarter is. So if I can't make it there, which I am, I'm like 128% last time I checked. Uh, so we're going to run out. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's been crazy. But that's kind of like the... like. Like when it's like, congratulations, it's like, it's like, okay, now I'm at the, I, I just drove all the way to the mountain, and I'm just about to take a hike. Uh, so that's kind of where it is now. So, so once I actually have um, the funding for it, that's where still things have to keep on going. So it's not like, yeah, everything's done. And then I can get going. But uh, so once I had the information, I, okay, I decided on Kickstarter uh, for that funding. And then, uh, then I had to go source the box. So that box is uh, for Orion. Uh, it's not a, a random box you're going to find on other knives. Uh, it's one that I figured out for that. Uh, and then, so I sourced the box, not through QSP. Uh, and then that is uh, one that I picked up. I wanted to still support U.S. companies, so that's where it's pocket pen. So that little pen that's going to be in there. Uh, so 105 uh, was that goal, and then everybody gets a pocket pen. So feel like Oprah with that. Everybody gets a pocket <laughs> pen. <laughs> so uh, so it's a USA product now printed in the U.S. Uh, the the um, uh, the stickers are going to be printed. Now that's going to be by DLH uh, screen printing that's in Salem, Oregon. Uh, so they're going to be doing the, uh, the labels. I mean the actual stickers. Uh, so like these type of stickers. Oh, oh nice. So, so this, this is not the <clears throat> exclusive one. So I'm going to have exclusive stickers for the backers. That's just a regular sticker for the campaign. Uh, and then, um, yeah. So after doing the Kickstarter, then I teamed up with Jack farm boy. Uh, he has another YouTube channel, Instagram, uh, also, Gearhouse Media is what he started uh, when he helped the, out with Dan Designs. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, he helped with their launch. 
Uh, so I teamed up with him. Uh, he's the one that did the video for it, and, um, the photos that are on the uh, Kickstarter campaign. So I teamed up with him. Uh, so it's a lot of those type of networking things to try and figure things out and try and make it all work. Uh, and then writing everything up. Um, and one thing to know about Kickstarter is uh, they take about a 10% cut uh, from your whole campaign. So, uh, and then they also will take about uh, 20 days to fund. So I, I worked it all into the timeline uh, for the knife and that's all on the Kickstarter. You can kind of see you know, where I'm looking at for the timeline because I want to hit the goal. Uh, so unless something else happens other than COVID, which I, I hopefully doesn't, uh, then uh, you will get your knife uh, shipped to you in February of 2021. So do the knives come to you and then yep. you ship them out? Do you, do yep. you look them over your, I, I assume you're going to yep. do, so do gonna, your own. Yeah, so I'm going to get them all in. Uh, I'm going to uh, QC them. Uh, that's going to be um, here in Oregon. And then I'll be packing them. So I'm going to be doing basically everything else. So so once everything is sourced, it's going to all, all come to me. And then I'm going to be QCing the knives, packing the knives, putting the little pen in there, uh, all the little um, information and then it'll be sent out. Uh, so I'm using like stamps.com uh, to try and work that out because it goes to people's homes, goes to PO boxes. FedEx doesn't deliver PO boxes. UPS mm -hmm. doesn't deliver to PO boxes. So I want to have something that was a pretty well established. And then even working with Monterey Bay Knives, I was able to talk with him a little bit. Uh, and so that's something that he uses. And then uh, he recommended a thermal printer. So I picked up a little thermal printer. So there's so many different steps that you don't think about uh, when you just buy a knife or um, it just, just so many things, like even down to, well, what font size do I want on the box and where do I want to place it? So you don't think about those things normally. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it sounds like you have this whole operation so well in hand you seem to have thought of everything and uh um i can't help but think that some of uh some of that comes from the channel some of it comes from receiving so many knives through the pass around group mm -hmm. and uh and and really breaking them down for yourself to discover what you like so now that you've you haven't been through this process. You are in the throes of the yeah. process and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and it will be going on for quite some time, yeah. but you're in the thick of it. Uh, how has it changed how you look at the knives you're now getting in the pass around or that you're buying uh, to review for your channel? Uh, yeah, it's changed a little bit because it's like, I really like the knife that I made and it seems like other people like it as well. So it's, it's uh, kind of become one of those uh, little standards as far as, okay, well, is it better than the knife that I'm designing or that I designed and producing? Uh, and that's kind of what I look at uh, for those knives. It's still, I still enjoy what I have. And then I kind of try and have like some type of like, you know, in fragrance mm -hmm. stores, they have like, um, like the coffee beans to try and like bring you back to like, a regular scent. So yeah. I try to have some baselines as far as, okay, what does a $80 knife, what does a $50 knife look like as far as a good one? Uh, so I'm not trying to compare it to a $200 knife or a Sabenza or something to, um, to okay, well, this Sabenza is much better than this $20 knife. I think, yeah, well, that's going to be a no. <laughs> it should be, shouldn't it? It should be, yes. Uh, so that's kind of where I try and figure out. Uh, so it hasn't really changed uh, that much. It's probably taken away a little bit from it because I'm really trying to concentrate on getting it running. Uh, so I used to be doing like two to three videos a week, and I'm doing one to two videos a week uh, to try and get that in. Uh, but still running the pass around group. Uh, and then trying to get caught up on the metal or the HRC testing uh, spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. I worked on that uh, uh, prior to everything else and I put that together. So LTK is still doing a lot of his, uh, the HRC testing. And then I developed that spreadsheet for that. Uh, so what do you think of the Malibu? Oh, uh, Malibu, I, want I to, haven't, yeah, yeah. I want I you to that. name names about button lock knives that you like. I mean, besides TIETAC 2, who's doing it right in your opinion? Uh, as far as a uh, really good tolerance, uh, Med the Medford is a very uh, good knife. Now, so now, except for the placement of the flipper tab and the detent. Uh, so those things, he could have, it could have either had better detent or it could have had a different placement of the flipper tab. And that would have just really sealed the deal for that knife. Uh, Protec is excellent at it. I mean, they do a great job for their button locks. Uh, I haven't been able to experience Brian Ty's actual work, uh, mm -hmm. but the the um, the CRKT 
version of it when I first started was good and was fun. Um, but now I, I kind of outgrew it in a sense uh, because it is very sloppy and it's not, they didn't improve on it. So that's where I was like looking for that because when the TITAC 2 came out um, and then now they have the new Brian ties, the TIE fighters, I was expecting there to be a better lockup and everything else. And it's not there. And that's where I was kind of let down um, by CRKT with that. But they produce a lot of knives. So it, they work with great designers. They have great designs that come out. It just, um, if they could step that up, because really uh, a knife that I was really surprised by and everybody's going to cringe. So so hold on to yourself. I mean, go and hold the chair and anything. m -Tech makes a good <gasps> button lock. Well, I never really. Uh, yes, they make a really good button lock. I bought it for like eight bucks or something, and then like granted, some of them are a little sloppy, but I bought like five of them, and then I think three, three or four out of the five were like solid. They're locked up real well. I uh, I was really surprised and impressed by that. That's interesting. That's another company that makes a million knives a year, yeah. and uh, or obviously probably more than that. But yeah, you know, it makes you makes you wonder why not just. Why not just, well, like with CRKT, they work with, they, they just put out so many great, great designs. If they could reduce that by a third and step it up just a touch, you know, with the materials and I'm, and from what I'm hearing, uh, just with the fit, you know, yeah. for the locks and stuff like that, I, I feel like that could knock them in the stratosphere instead of coming out with these very expensive other mm -hmm. knives like the Shock, you know, which is just so beyond the pale compared to the others. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean the 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 lock is is decent as far as it's very strong uh, for the deadbolt lock. Uh, mm -hmm. They're doing it better. The M40 um, that came out uh, with the deadbolt lock on it now works really really well. Uh, blade's super thick, so it's not a good slicer, but it's it's there's purposes for it. Uh, and that's where um, there's just button locks, not a lot coming out. I mean, I know Swags has hers coming out. Uh, she has one uh, coming out through Kaiser, and so. Uh, that's oh, yeah, that's be, right. That's yeah. right. So she's going to have her button lock, flipper, thumb studs, and everything, too. Uh, so it might be kind of the resurgence of the button lock because as much as it is, push the button on the box. And I, that is uh, literally push the button. Uh, so if you had anybody, a knife, a new person or anything else, it's very, uh, very, um, like, yeah, because like, how do you close it? And they're like pushing on the lock bar the other way and trying to yeah, figure it out. Yeah. And then it's like, really just push the button. Like that's how you close it, your hands out of the way. But it's also kind of push the button and kind of like um, everything that you have nowadays, the coffee machine, everything else, a lot of cars, just push the button and let's go. And it's like yeah. kind of like, it's another kind of thing for push the button. Oh, it makes perfect sense. It's totally intuitive. <clears throat> I remember um, at, uh, doing something for work several summers back, and I handed someone a paramilitary two because uh, mm. he asked for a knife. I'm like, sure, you know. And 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 this guy, this person in particular, I knew it was yeah. kind of funny handing this person in particular a, a, a knife. I was like, I wonder, I wonder what he's going to come back with. He was done using it, and he came back, and he was like, eh. I, <laughs> I was like. Just, it's yeah. to me, I'm like, I see a little tab. I know to push it, but yeah, right here, push the button. No one's going to have any, any, any issues uh, closing this. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the design of this mm -hmm. um, uh, for usability. This is uh this is like a, a super EDC knife. Yeah. And that's and, the main goal of it. And uh, you have this really nice drop point blade with a really nice point. That's basically centered with the pivot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was the plan I, for that. Okay. I, I like that a lot. I also like, uh, this is, uh, you know, Spyderco talks about their 50-50 choil. This is like a 70-30 choil. And yeah. and it, it's really, it feels really, really great. Yeah. Um, but it, it's also, it allows you to have uh, a grip all the way back without feeling like you're running off the back, like a stage or something like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, really really uh great design i even like this little semi thumb ramp because mm -hmm. i i like how it feels on the back of my thumb in this uh, sort of forward grip uh, yeah. when my thumb is right there and so uh design wise i think this is a, a really uh excellent excellent knife i i love like i said i love how discreetly you you uh, have a milled titanium clip on a sub 100 dollars knife mm -hmm. uh that can swap to the other side um Man, very nicely done on this 
on this. Yeah, because the, the ramp that's there now that you just talked about, uh, the, there's the two pur uh, purposes for that, because that was actually to not have jimping, because I did not want to have jimping there, because that's one thing that bothers me about flipper tabs, and that you run your finger into the jimping on the back of the knife. I don't like that. Uh, so I want to have something to allow for grip um, without having jimping there. Uh, and then also I want to put the button in a place where you're not worrying about uh, actually pressing it while you're in use. So that's why I moved a little bit forward. So if you see on a lot of the other button locks, they're a little bit uh, behind the pivot. Uh, mm -hmm. Mine is a, basically a, a little bit of in forward uh, in front of the pivot. Uh, and that kind of changed um, the way that the whole knife kind of operated a little. And then I did make the the front trail, I mean the front uh, finger trail, a little bit bigger too, because some people were a little concerned about it. So I was like, oh, I'll make it like, and that's down to millimeters. So I made it uh, four millimeters uh, bigger uh, than I originally had it. Uh, so how did you decide on the size? Is this your wheelhouse for uh, knives you like to carry? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Now, 4.25 was the original goal for it. I think there was a mixed up in uh, some of the translation for it because I wanted to make sure that the blade actually you now fit into the handle. So mm -hmm. when it, the first one came out of the 3D print, the uh, blade was a little bit short of the handle. And then so I was like, oh, could you, you know, adjust that? And then so they, instead of making the blade longer uh, to adjust for it, they uh, made the handle shorter. <laughs> uh, so, oh, whoops. So, so, yeah, so it's like 3.17 as far as like, depending on where you measure it, but basically the furthest point forward is 3.17. I was going for a 3.25. Uh, so, uh, and then well, that's that, one thing. Yeah. No, no, please. Oh, and that's one thing I wanted to um, found out about it in two, because then I wanted to have the the um, inner liner, not a full liner. And then some of the things, even um, he, um, one of the folks, um, he, you know, who, who said that? One of the channels. I'll think about it later. But um, OCD for EDC mentioned about it being modular. And yes, it can be. So taking that, that same lock, all the parts, other than the handle scale and the blade, um, I can... I'm planning to try and figure out how to offer just a new handle scales and a new blade, and you can make a bigger knife or you can make a smaller knife um, out of the same knife. So something modular, a modular yeah. system like that. That yeah. sounds, that sounds cool. So uh, after February, 2021, okay. All, all of these uh, knives come to your place, yep. uh, your, your office, you go through them all, you QC them, you package them up, you send them off. Then what happens? Yep. Then uh, I'll hopefully have the website fully running by then. It's still up now for ryanknives.com. Uh, but right now it's kind of showing the pictures, all the reviews. So whenever a new review comes out on YouTube, then I put it up there. Um, I have some people on Instagram that checked it out uh, as far as Shadowborn Hanks. And then uh, um, I forgot the other name of the person. I'm bad with names sometimes. Uh, what, what, I, what name was that? I think I wrote it down somewhere. Yeah, tech writer. I just looked at it okay. uh, as well on Instagram. Uh, so that's where I'm going to be looking to have the extra scales, um, the different colors for the pivot, and the backspacer available through the website. Um, and then that's where um, I'll be selling the knives as well. So, so when you do a Kickstarter campaign, a Kickstarter mm -hmm. campaign, and you fully fund it, and you've 128 percent funded yours. Um, that means a certain amount of knives are made, but they're not all spoken for, correct? Yeah, uh, correct. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so you're gonna have you're gonna have more knives to sell. Yeah. It, you don't. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm adjusting it. So, so initially I had an idea as far as how many I was gonna make, and I'm um, having to readjust that because I'm I'm getting close to where I was gonna how many I was gonna make. So I'm gonna have to adjust for <laughs> that initial order, uh, and that's one thing that's nice about, about Kickstarter is you get to know what the demand is. So I could mm -hmm. I could have made so many knives and then I sold 50. I could have, and then, so that's where it's kind of a hard thing about it. And that's where it kind of helps with the Kickstarter campaign. So you know, okay, well, how much demand is there? And then if I was ever gonna make 200 knives and then now on Kickstarter, I'm selling 500 knives. Well, I better make 600, 700 knives or more. Uh, so that's gives an idea as far as that goes. So do you have other designs in the offing? Do you have things you want to uh, bring forward? I have other ideas. I don't. I've been really concentrated on this, so I I don't have like yeah. the the wheelhouse of. I, like, I don't. I don't mean to be like down. nice yeah. knife. What's yeah, next? Like, what's next? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I've already got that question before. Uh, so I'm yeah. looking at different things, but uh, really, I I don't want it to be a revolving door of knives. This is the so Solaris. Um, is of the sun, uh, Latin word. Uh, so that's kind of really where there's going to be because every other knife product 
or knife is going to be uh, kind of orbiting around the Solaris knife. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where it's going to be kind of that fixture knife, kind of like a rat two, rat one, that is just always there. So that's the idea behind it. And I don't want to have, granted, if it happens, I, I really don't want to have like 20 different models that I'm uh, working with. I want to just really concentrate on what's what I enjoy, what I like, and then kind of go from there. Well, I, I, uh, in being totally honest with you, this is not in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, once I, I got it in hand, man, uh, I, it's really compelling to me. And uh, I, I really love this knife in, in the one day I've had it. And I know I'm sending it along, so I'm not I'm not developing yeah, a, yeah. a true bond. But yeah. uh, I think this knife has a lot of character. Not only is it, uh, uh, by the way, it's 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 a th relatively thin blade stock, and it's got a high uh, mm -hmm. flat grind, and it is yep. thin and slicey. We haven't even talked about the performance of the blade, but uh, this is uh, a really a really great knife, and I could see how um, it could be great for people with big giant meat, you know, mm -hmm. meat meat paws what are meat hook hands yep. they, they get them on there and uh i just uh i think you've done an excellent job and and i'm really excited to see these hit the market yeah. and see uh you know how how uh orion knives progresses yeah indeed yeah it's worked well with like people with small hands big hands that's one thing that's been able to pass it around even through like um a therapeutic edge and a women carry knives and yeah. their husband wife team they've checked it out and both of them love it and they both fought over it when they first got it in christine won uh, mm -hmm. so she got to handle it first but uh but those are the type of things that it just it works for a lot of people i mean that and i even tried it in different grips even like the reverse grip and the you know, more of a pull cut uh, it just really uh, worked well uh, for all those different uh, um, different uh, grips for the knife. Yeah, it's got that nice curve to keep you bracketed in, but it's neutral enough that you could mm -hmm. you can change it up. So uh, I want to switch gears here before we wrap up. You are a Blade Banter channel. You review yeah. lots of knives. That means you're eligible for our speed round. No, and, right. uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is a this is a a one word answer question. And as I go down, I might pause to customize uh customize the question for you uh but maybe not shall we see yeah, yeah we shall see all righty sir so first fixed or folder folder flipper or thumb stud uh thumb stud many times washers or bearings uh, bearings okay tip up or tip down uh tip up but tip down has uh, some points to it sorry not one word <laughs> uh, but I get I get your meaning. Uh, Tanto or Bowie? Bowie. Bowie or Bowie? <laughs> oh, now get into this. I guess there's there's a. I guess it would be Bowie, not Bowie, because Bowie is the singer. So Bowie. Okay. Hollow ground or flat ground? Uh, flat grind. Full size or small? Full size. Uh, gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Gentleman's knife. Automatic or Bally song? Uh, Bally song, actually. Uh, ZT or Wii? Wii. Okay. Benchmade or Hogue? Uh, Benchmade. Real Steel or Steel Will? Real Steel. Excellent. Okay. Uh, milled Titanium or Spring Clip? Um, milled. Okay. Carbon Fiber or Micarta? Carbon Fiber. Finger choil or no choil? No, finger choil. Ah, how'd I know? How'd I know? Yeah. Form yeah. or function? Function. Okay. And now your desert island knife. That's one knife that you get to keep for the rest of your life. And it's uh, not the Solaris. No. It would probably just be a Mora knife. Mora makes an amazing product. Ah, that's... Hmm. That's a good answer. That's a that's an uncommon but good answer. And uh, uh, someone just we had on the show recently, Ed Calderon, mentioned the uh, incredible benefits of the Mora for things you might not expect them to be great at. Yeah, uh, yeah excellent, excellent knife. Well, David Cam, uh, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah. And uh, I hope you uh, wish you all the best with Orion Knives. But uh, it doesn't look like you need my well wishes because you're uh, well on your way doing an awesome job uh, getting the Solaris out. Yeah, appreciate it. And if there's anybody that has questions or reach out um, and everything else, because it's it's a long process. 
process, there's a lot of things that are really um, intricate about uh, the movement and how things operate. Uh, but yeah, I'll be able to help people out as well. So tell people how they can reach out uh, to you and also find you on uh, on Kickstarter. Yeah, uh, Kickstarter and says Orion or Orion Knives uh, on Kickstarter. Uh, so have until September uh, 7th to uh, join into that. And then uh, Instagram is Blade Banter. And YouTube is also Blade Banter. And the website is OrionKnives.com. All righty, David. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. And uh, I'll talk to you soon, sir. Take yeah. care. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Got a question or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. All right. Forgot to unmute my mic. <laughs> All right. Cool. That was an awesome interview. I, I enjoyed that one, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I needed, I need to go back over it and take notes. He, yeah. David has it all buttoned down. I, uh, he seems to really, uh, uh, all, all of the years of, well, the couple of years of, of being a YouTube reviewer, going to blade show networking, uh, on YouTube and meeting all these people has really paid off. He's used all those connections and, uh, all the smarts he's gained to really, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with his game plan. Uh, not just what he has lined up for the future, but how he's already progressed. And I have to say, you know, as I've mentioned now a million times, right. I dig this knife. Right. Well, uh, and, and in case anybody didn't catch it, I did catch that pun uh, where you said David really has it buttoned down. Oh, so yeah, that's about right. The button lock, yeah, yeah, that's boom. right. <laughs> I'm so, so good, I don't even know it. He doesn't even realize it. Yeah, <laughs> I and I think it would be uh, really cool to have him back on a, uh, a podcast down the road, maybe later after the knife comes out, to really talk about the business part of this process because, you know, that's something that's, that's always interesting. We, we kind of touch on it with some makers, that kind of thing, but really go deep into it and kind of learn the inner workings of the, the business side of it, which a lot of folks don't talk about. Yeah, yeah. We'll get him to open his books, show him right on <laughs> camera. Right. No, I'm That's just right. kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. that, that does sound like a good idea because uh, there are a lot of a lot of people out there with different aspirations in this hobby. Right. And, uh, you know, as much information as you can gather from people who are on different uh, different legs of their of their Absolutely. own journeys, the better. Absolutely. All right. Well, we'll uh, of course, have uh, show notes and uh, pictures and more kind of good stuff on the knifejunkie.com slash 144. That's the knifejunkie.com slash 144. That's the hub of everything, the knifejunkie.com. You can find the podcast, the videos, photos, and more. So we encourage you to visit the website and uh, let us know what you think of this uh, video format, which we have been doing for a few weeks now on the uh, on the podcast interviews, kind of uh, expanding the podcast into video to have a chance to actually show off some knives, if, as you did on this show. So we'd love to hear from you. Uh, give us a call at 724-466-4487. That's the listener line number, 724-466-4487. Or just uh, email Bob at bob at the knife junkie dot com all right bob final uh, final thought as we uh, wrap it up here well uh you know if you have a have an idea you want to you want to enact you take a step and uh then you take another one and then you take another one and you david on starter uh, yeah that's right <laughs> and david cam is a perfect uh, example of that all right hey thanks everybody for joining us on again episode number 144 of the knife junkie podcast so for the knife junkie himself mr bob demarco i'm jim the knife newbie over here saying thanks so much for joining us on the knife junkie podcast thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast if you enjoyed the show please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com for show notes for today's episode additional resources and to listen to past episodes visit our website thenifejunkie.com you can also watch our latest videos on youtube YouTube at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on the knifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at the knifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 